Our next macromolecule is proteins. The monomer of a protein is going to be the amino acid. If you put a lot of amino acids together, you get the polymer, um, which we generally refer to as a polypeptide. Um, you'll see later the difference between a protein and a polypeptide. Um, the types of bonds that form in between amino acids are referred to as peptide bonds. Um, so that's where the name polypeptide comes from. So here is your monomer, which you need to be able to identify. A single generic amino acid. They all have the same structure with what is referred to as the central carbon in the middle. Um, this NH3 is referred to, excuse me, NH2 is referred to as the amine group. And then this COOH is called carboxylic acid. Um, so this is the acid group. Um, and then the fourth substituent on this central carbon is the R group and that's what's different on each amino acid. Um, so if you want to put amino acids together to make a polypeptide, um, that process is called dehydration synthesis or it's the type of reaction that takes place. Uh, so this carbon lets go of this OH, this nitrogen lets go of that hydrogen they get together and form water and then a new covalent bond is formed between carbon and nitrogen over there and that's the peptide bond. If you want to reverse the process you just add back the water um, and use the water to split or lyse the peptide bond so it's referred to as hydrolysis. Um, so here are a couple of different amino acids. As we said the side group, this R, is what gives each amino acid its chemical and physical properties and then the collective properties of all of the amino acids in a polypeptide give that peptide or that protein its final shape and function. Uh, just to give you an example of uh, physical properties or chemical properties, uh, glycines are very small so if you need to form a tight bend in your polypeptide strand you use glycine because you can pack a lot of glycines together in a small area and get the polypeptide to bend. Uh, aspartic acid has an additional acid group on it here so even when it's incorporated into a protein it can give up this hydrogen here and act as an acid. Um, so this is an example of an acidic amino acid. This is an example of a basic amino acid. Um, so remember this part here is not there in the protein so you've just got the side group. This side group has this NH2 on it which can absorb an extra hydrogen. It'll take on a positive charge so it acts like a base reducing the hydrogen ion content in the solution. Uh, and cysteine has some special chemical properties that we're just not going to talk about. Um, so next up is levels of structure of a protein. We will cover them in the order that they are listed there. Um, when you put it all together you get a protein that has a mature shape which we refer to as the conformation. And which is just an important term to know. So the primary structure as it says here is simply the sequence of amino acids. You could read it out without even drawing the structure. You know, glutamate, lysine, cysteine, uh, glutamic acid, I said that once already. It's just the order of amino acids. Secondary structure is when you get specific forms being made by the carbon nitrogen backbone this part right here um, when this backbone twists or bends into shapes that we can identify we refer to that as secondary structure if the backbone forms this corkscrew that you can see here that's referred to as an alpha helix um, sometimes the backbone runs back and forth so if you see here it's carbon, carbon, nitrogen, and the backbone is running this way. And then you need to envision it looping back around and running again and looping back around. So when the backbone runs back and forth like this in a parallel fashion, it's what's referred to as a beta pleated sheet. These are both examples of secondary structure. The tertiary structure is the final shape that one polypeptide strand will make. Um, so here's one end of the polypeptide and there's the other end 
and it's just one long strand of amino acids unbroken. And you can see that the tertiary structure can have different examples of secondary structure within it. So there's some beta pleated sheets here and an alpha helix there. Um, if this polypeptide can perform the function that the body needs all by itself, then this protein only has tertiary structure and the polypeptide is the functional protein. Sometimes more than one polypeptide has to be combined in order for the molecule to form the function that the body needs or perform the function. In that case you have quaternary structure. Uh, so the protein we have here is hemoglobin. Each one of these multicolored little tube things is, an, uh, is a polypeptide. Um, so hemoglobin has four polypeptides stuck together to make the functional protein. It has quaternary structure. Uh, and the final shape again, confirmation, forgot that one was on the slide. Uh, so one of the important functions that proteins form is performing enzymatic reactions or acting as enzymes. And enzymes are biological catalysts. And what catalysts do is speed up reactions so that the reaction happens fast enough to actually support life. Without enzymes, all the reactions in your body would run very slowly and things wouldn't happen when your body needed them to happen. Now, the way they work is by lowering what's called the activation energy. If you remember back to forming the peptide bond. The carbon and the hydrogen first had to let go of the OH and the H to form water. That's an example of activation energy. If you have to break old bonds to form new bonds, you have to put energy in before you can get energy out, just as an example. And enzymes just make that easier through a variety of means and then if a reaction takes less energy it's going to proceed faster at the same temperature. Um, so some of the terminology we use the substances that the enzymes act upon are called substrates and then the product of the reaction is called a product um, and you'll notice here in this case or in all cases you get the enzymes back. Um, so a catalyst speeds up a chemical reaction but is not consumed or altered in the chemical reaction. So an enzyme is going to speed up a chemical reaction and not be altered in the chemical reaction. The location on the enzyme where the two substrates stick to it is referred to as the active site. Um, so if you look here, here's your enzyme and it's going to join two amino acids together. So this is the active site of the enzymes, enzyme where the two amino acids stick. This makes it easy for them to form a peptide bond and release the water. And then you get your enzyme back and your product being this dipeptide. Um, so the substrates interact with the active site that catalyzes a reaction to produce your product and you get back your enzyme that can then do this over and over and over again. So this I put in just to show you how important enzymes are and how many there are. Um, this is a poster that summarizes all of the biochemistry that we know of that goes on inside your cells. Um, each one of these blue pieces of text is an enzyme. Um, so there are millions of chemical reactions that go on inside your cells. Um, well, I don't know about millions, but lots. And each one of them has an enzyme that catalyzes it. So if you pull back, this is the same poster zoomed out. Um, all that blue you see is enzymes. So they control all of the chemistry and make sure that everything that's happening in your body happens when it needs to happen and where it needs to happen. So as we said before, proteins have to have the right shape or conformation in order to function. Um, think of the enzyme with the active site, right? If the active site doesn't fit amino acids in it, then that enzyme isn't going to catalyze the formation of the peptide bonds. Um, so there are two 
really good ways to denature or change the shape of a protein. Um, one is through heat. Um, so what happens when you heat up a protein is you make all the molecules move real fast. And then instead of all of the strands or amino acids within the polypeptide strand staying next to each other where you want them to be, the whole thing just starts vibrating and falls apart. And then pH is another way to denature or essentially cook your proteins. Uh, think about if you've ever marinated chicken in lemon juice and you leave it in for a long time and the edges of the chicken turn white, they've been cooked or denatured by the acid. Um, if you've ever had ceviche, maybe, maybe not, um, it's a seafood dish that's just cooked in, I believe it's lemon juice. So you just chop up all the seafood, throw it in lemon juice with maybe some tomatoes and I forget what else. Uh, and the acid, the citric acid from the lemon juice denatures all the proteins in the fish because it's a very delicate protein um, and cooks the protein for you that way. So that is proteins. Thanks for listening.